Good morning, everybody. My name is Darren Davis. Uh, I appreciate you coming out this morning. Um, this is my first trip to Bangalore, uh, but I think my fifth trip to India. I am by no means an expert in India, uh, but I, I seem to have more experience of it than most of my friends back in the United States. And so when they ask me about it, I tell them, well, the, the thing you have to understand about India, if you really want to understand India, you have to understand that roughly 80% of the population is Hindu, roughly 14% Muslim, 3 to 4% Christian, and 100% cricket. So <laughs> the fact that you are all here this morning, today, during the semifinals between Australia and India is a great testament to your dedication to Agile, and I appreciate it. Uh, I am the Director of Software Engineering for Providence Health and Services. I'm part of their strategy and innovation group. Prior to that, uh, I worked as the, uh, uh, I managed the development and mobile development and web development teams for a small coffee company called Starbucks, which I think you, you have a few Starbucks here in, uh, in India now. Uh, prior to that, back in 2006, uh, I was a development manager for a company called Corbis. Corbis is a media and image licensing company owned by Bill Gates with a really remarkable ability to lose money. So I, I worked for Corbis for probably eight years, and in that time, it was never profitable, and yet every year I got a five-figure bonus. So when Bill Gates went from being the richest man in the world to being the second richest man in the world, I like to say that I played a part in that just by working for Corbis. <clears throat> Incidentally, I, I guess he's now back on top as number one because I no longer work for Corbis. So I, I'll leave that to you to figure out. So 2006, summer of 2006, our sustainment engineering process was in a shambles. And I, when I say sustainment engineering, I'm talking about what's essentially that developer gulag you go to where you have to do all the support and maintenance work on existing systems. You don't get to do any of the new fun stuff. You do small feature enhancements, you do bug fixes. That's, that was our sustainment process, and it was a mess. We were running it as a series of waterfall-like projects, fixed scope, uh, releasing every quarter. Um, I, I used to liken it to like scooping a load of socks out of the dryer and trying to crab walk it up a flight of stairs without dropping anything. Uh, needless to say, it was disappointing for all the reasons that you would expect a, a waterfall-like process to be disappointing. Things would get dropped from scope. We'd run late. We wouldn't be able to do as much as they wanted. Often when we did those things, they weren't exactly what they wanted three months ago, right? So all kinds of heartache. And a group of us were starting to, to talk about how we could pull this process out of the tar pit, make it functional. <laughs> I was on the team that was doing that. Now, at some point during the summer, one of our team members, a guy named Rick Garber, and I'm going to mention a few names during this that you've probably never heard of, but that's, that's kind of the point. Uh, one of our teammates, Rick Garber, he went and he listened to a talk by a fascinating, beguiling Scotsman, a man named David Anderson, who talked about how he had solved some of the very same problems on one of his teams at Microsoft using the, uh, a Kanban-like method based on the theory of constraints and the works of folks like Goldratt and Deming, uh, part of his process, part of his method was to eliminate explicit uh, estimation from the process. And that was the thing that, that attracted me first because I, I've always disliked the process of software estimation. I've always likened it to voodoo, right? It's just magic. Sometimes we, at, at, at best it's a guess, at worst it's a lie. Uh, but some of the other concepts that he brought, some of the other theories I thought were very, very compelling as well. I mean, it blew my mind to think of software as inventory that could go stale. I mean, that's crazy. It's a crazy idea. But it makes sense, right? Particularly in these long waterfall cycles or these long development cycles, what you start with at the end, what your need is at the end, or at the, at the beginning, is maybe not what it is at the end because the market changes, the opportunity shifts. Right? That blew my mind. I never thought of it that way. I never thought that it would be possible to make idle certain resources in order to get better systemic efficiency. And the theory of constraints kinds of, kind of proves that out. So a bunch of us read his book. We had a lot of 
impassioned conversations. We were, we were almost like religious converts, you know, our eyes shining with revolutionary zeal, ready to remake the world, or at least our sustainment process. So we started designing our very own Kanban-based system. Now, it took us a few months. It extended well into the fall of 2006. And sometime during that, that process, David actually joined the company as the director of engineering. I began reporting to him. Uh, I'm going to name some names here. There will not be a test. You don't need to, to remember them. But uh, also on the team were Dominica de Grandis, Mark Grody, Larry Cohen, Rick Garber, and Stephen Weiss. Again, a whole bunch of folks you probably never heard of. David guided us through the rest of the process, and finally, uh, about November, we had, uh, we'd settled on a design, a design that had his blessing. So we trained our team. We trained them in the, in the theory of constraints and Kanban systems in general. We ran through simulations. We, we, we populated our queues, and with a fair amount of excitement and a little bit of fanfare, we launched the first significant Kanban-based system that we were aware of. It promptly went nowhere. For months, it went nowhere. That was not our plan, so obviously it was a little disappointing. Now keep in mind that uh, the system we built was based on David's first book, uh, Agile, Agile Management for Software Engineering. Not a subsequent work, not the subsequent work of other people in the industry who've sort of embraced Kanban and, and taken it to where it is today. Uh, there, were, there were no real practical examples of how to implement his theories in his first book, right? And, and we designed our system based on the same way he had designed his at, at Microsoft, which he told us had been a great success. And yet, our process was quickly proving to be a non-starter. It was very frustrating for everybody involved. It was frustrating for the developers and, and testers, all the software engineers, because they couldn't see where things were in the process. It was very frustrating for our customers because they were only seeing a very thin trickle of work out of this grand experiment. Now, I'm, I'm gonna say it again. The Kanban we're talking about at this point, the process we're talking about at this point, bears no resemblance to the Kanban that we know today. It's an entirely digital process. We've got 25 work items in TFS, Team Foundation Server, scattered across 25 separate queues with this incredibly complicated web of transitions and reasons for transitions between various states. We so over-engineered this process. Uh, and, and maybe that's what was actually uh, leading to some of the complication. Um, now, according to the theory, according to the theory that we all um, heartily embraced, it should be a self-managing process. It should have been a self-managing process. Right? That you just, as a developer or an analyst or a, a, a tester, you focus on your queue. Right? Just focus on your queue. Something comes in. You pull the work in. You do it when you've got, when you've got capacity. You move it on. Right? We designed it specifically so people just had that kind of telescopic focus on their particular queue, and yet it didn't seem to be working. They were, they were complaining. They didn't have any, any sort of global view of what was going on. I would like to say that we were, uh, <clears throat> we were hurtling toward disaster, but that really implies way too much velocity. I mean, the truth of the matter is we were grinding to a halt. The system was beginning to collapse under its own weight. Now, in February of 2007, I got called into the CIO's office, a guy named Stephen Gillette. He's now president COO of Symantec, I think, down in, down in the Bay Area in uh, California. And he said to me, uh, if, if you don't fix this, I'm going to have to fire somebody. Which, you know, it's a pretty motivating thing to be told, I suppose. <clears throat> um, I didn't actually think he meant that I had to fix it, but I certainly believed that I was the one who would get fired if it didn't get fixed. As it turns out, actually, he was talking about firing somebody else, but that's a story over cocktails, I think. Um, so I got together with David's leadership team. We all got together and we said, okay, well, what can we do to get this thing unstuck? At, the point, at this point, 
We're not trying to fix the process. We're not trying to fix the process because we hadn't realized yet that the process was what was broken. We, were, we simply, I think, naively thought it was just a problem of combustion, right? If we could just get the machine firing, if we could just get it rolling downhill, that it would, get, it would, it would take off and we could just manage it the same way that we had, we had originally designed. So in order to get things unstuck, we decided we would implement a stand-up. Now, maybe it surprises you to think that we didn't have a stand-up. You know, it's an agile methodology. We didn't have a stand-up. Our only experience with stand-ups to this point had been the stand-ups in our previous sustainment process, where the team had, had heard about agile, and so they wanted to implement stand-ups. And these had degenerated into these 30 to 45-minute daily morning marathon slogs. It becomes very hard to stand up for 45 minutes. Uh, and I, you know, I, if I've ever been dogmatic about anything in all this process stuff, it's that your stand-up should only be 15 minutes long. If, if your stand-up's longer than 15 minutes, I believe you're doing it wrong. There, there, I said it. So we decided that we would implement a stand-up just to get things running. We would do it for a month. We'd run it for a month. And once things got started, we'd, we'd go back to letting, managing it the way we'd originally designed. Now, I volunteered or insisted on running the stand-ups because I didn't want it to go longer than 15 minutes. I knew that if I ran it, I could keep it moving, we'd get it done, 15 minutes tops, we'd be out of there. Now, I'd never run a stand-up before. Uh, I have some experience being on stage in front of people but I'd never run a stand-up for engineers, and I don't know if you, if you agree or not, but engineers can be a very, very difficult audience. Very, very challenging. <clears throat> um, they don't let you get away with much, let's just say that. So I didn't know what I was gonna do. I'd never run one before. Um, I had this idea that since people were complaining that they had no idea where things were in the process, well, we'll show them the process. We'll put a board up and we'll put the work up there and they can see it. But that, I didn't, you know, I didn't really have an idea, okay, what is it gonna look like? And I went in and I talked to some of our senior devs. These were guys who were uh, fairly uh, high level in the organization. They had a title of architect. And as luck would have it, actually, they'd been spending the entire week that week doing a color domain modeling exercise. I don't know if you know what color domain modeling is, but it's using color-coded post-it notes to collaboratively design architectures to represent your system. And it allows for very quick change to be able to iterate and iterate and iterate and iterate, rather than have one guy go off for several hours and work on a Visio and then hand it off and, you know, uh, to others for, for comment. So they'd just been through this process, this workshop with a guy named Daniel Vacanti. And I came in and I said, hey, you know, I want to do this thing. And they said, okay, yeah, sounds like a good idea. Yeah, go do that. And one of the guys, a guy named Kirk Kwame, he said, oh, yeah, you could use different color post-it notes to, do, to describe different kinds of things in the system, right? He just spent the week doing exactly that, made a bunch of sense. So I went, that home, went home that weekend, I thought about it, and came up with a very simple design. Now, this is back in 2007, so the most common color of post-it note back then was uh, yellow. This was in a time when post-it notes were not as evolved as they are today, where it's very decadent. There are all kinds of colors and shapes and sizes of, of post-it notes, very limited. So yellow was the most common. We'd use those for features, things that people had asked us to do. That's what we, we would use yellow to represent that. We would use blue to represent bugs because both blue and bug began with the letter B. And that was about as deeply as we thought about it, right? I mean, it was that, it was that kind of simple. So uh, that's how it began. We started on Monday. I got to work a little bit early. I drew up some fairly crude cues. I wrote up some post-it notes, put some information on them, put them in the right place, and waited for people to show up. Now, that first day, um, we had told people st stand-up was, was actually optional. You didn't have to show up to stand-up unless something was assigned to you. And if something was assigned to you, then you better be there to explain it if need be. Uh, but that first day, most of the team showed up. And I, I don't know why. I mean, it may have been because they wanted to be a part of something going on, some new experiment. It may have been because 
Uh, they wanted to feel like they were part of the team. It was probably because the stand-up happened in a fairly public place. And when I'm up there waving my arms, it's a little distracting and hard to do anything else but participate. Whatever the reason, most of the team showed up that day. And for the rest of my time at Corbis, it would be a pretty large and inclusive group. So the first most pressing problem we were trying to solve and in fact, the only problem we were trying to solve at that point is why stuff wasn't moving through the queues. Why isn't it moving through? So to that end, that's where we focused. That's where we focused our, our stand-up. It seems obvious now, I think, when I think about it, it seems obvious that focusing on blocking issues is a pretty significant component in a stand-up, whether it's a Scrum stand-up, whether it's a Kanban stand-up. At the time, we didn't know, right? It just seemed obvious. So that was our focus. <clears throat> Over time, we'd sort of refine the questions a, a bit. But it really came down to, is there anything blocking you that isn't represented on the board? If it's not on the board and it's blocking you, we'll get it on the board. Of all the things that are on the board, is somebody specifically tasked right now with clearing that, that, that block? And do you need anything from me, the pointy-headed boss, in order to get those things unstuck. Right? That, was, that was really the focus. And we didn't spend a bunch of time doing other kinds of what I think of as open mic night, what we call open mic night in the US. I don't know if you know this. You, you, know, you put a mic up on stage, and people take turns coming up and doing their, their little song and dance. That's, that's you know, how scrum stand-ups always struck me. You know, here's what I did yesterday. Here's what I'm doing today. We didn't focus on any of that. You know, we started making some assumptions. We started assuming that you're an adult and you are a professional who takes pride in what you do, and you're going to, yesterday you did your job, and today you're gonna to do your job, and what I wanna know is what isn't working in the process? What's not right? What are the exceptions? Let's assume that things are working, and let's focus on the ex exceptions, and that's what we ended up doing. We always kept it under 15 minutes, always. Often, we would keep the stand-up under 10 minutes. Don't waste people's time. But an interesting thing started to happen. We would break up, you know, we'd say, all right, anything, anything else? All right, going once, going twice. Thank you, everybody. Have a great day. And people would start to cluster in twos and threes and groups and start to collaborate. They'd start to have conversations. There was an energy in the room. There was an energy coming out of the stand-up that hadn't been there before. People felt engaged. They were leaning forward into the work. They were using the board to plan their work. This was all stuff we discovered, right? This was all, these were all happy accidents we came across. Now, I don't recall who came up with the idea of using pink sticky notes to represent issues. I, I, I really, I can't remember. I wish I could, I would buy them a drink. Uh, because it was one of those very simple but brilliant, I think, innovations that help us, helped us to stumble on one of the most significant benefits of contemporary Kanban, and that is this visualization of the work in progress, the inherent power of visualizing information. Now, we didn't invent this, right? This, the, if, if any of you know the work of Edward Tufte, um, he's, he's written books about this in the past, the, the, quantitative, or the visual display of quantitative information. You know, that's a, that's a very highfalutin sort of title, but it's essentially taking and being able to display in a meaningful way, at a glance, the state of a system. And that's what we stumbled on in this Kanban process. We could put a pink sticky note on an item, and to even the most casual, uninformed observer, that clearly signaled that there was a problem. You could stand way back, and you could see the problem. You could also see how things were moving through the system. Were there bottlenecks? Those became very clear. What's the batch size of the next release? You know, those things became very clear from a distance. But you could also then walk up very close to the board, and you could see this developer is actually working on three different things. We shouldn't have her doing that. She should be focused on one. Let's help her refocus. So you get different, different levels of information, different levels of data out of the same board. Again, these were things we just sort of stumbled on. And it seems obvious now, but at the time, it wasn't there. Uh, it also became a, a, a focus of discussion and planning. I mentioned this a, a, a minute ago. Our 
tester, a guy named Tom Utterback, who, odd side note, is also my brother-in-law, uh, and our build guy, Doug Burrows, they would actually plan their work at the board. They would use it to plan their work. They'd be able to say, well, I can move this item in, but that's going to take six hours of testing. I should be moving it in. I'll tell you what, let's take the one below it, because that's only going to be taking me 30 minutes. We can move that in. They would, they would strategize around the board. It became a very useful tool. It also became a great advertisement for people who were in the business. You could walk, you know, our business owners could walk through at any time and see this. All of it seems obvious now, right? Wasn't so at the time. So the process of prioritizing work. <laughs> this, is, this is what I, I think of as Thunderdome. This is um, getting a group of folks together to decide, all right, we have limited resources. What are they going to work on next? Well, this was, a, was done in a weekly meeting uh, run by a woman named Diana Kolmietz, who, who played a vital role, I think, in really helping us codify all this. But she ran the prioritization process. And it was a representative from each of the various business areas, marketing, finance, sales, uh, imaging. They would get together once a week. Uh, they, it went through several iterations like everything else, but eventually what they settled on is this process of nomination where everybody would nominate items for the week to be worked on, and everybody got three votes, and then horse trading would go on. If you'll vote for my item, I'll support you on your item. People would vote. Whatever got the most votes uh, would be moved into our engineering ready queue. We'd start work on it. Now, one of the guys, uh, a man named Drew McLean, he was the VP of uh, uh, imaging. He was a former military guy. Spent all his time in manufacturing. He'd recently come to our company from Boeing, which is, you know, an airplane manufacturer. Uh, so he was very familiar with all these concepts, and he insisted that we include what's called a silver bullet, uh, which is an expedited request. Now, we resisted this at first because we figured if we include a silver bullet in this, everything's going to become a silver bullet, right? Um, everybody, want, everybody thinks that their thing is incredibly important needs to be done right away. But what we did is we put a couple of breaks on the process. We added two rules. We said, yes, we'll do this, but on two conditions. All right. Condition one is that there can be only one, one and only one expedited request in the entire process at a time. Not just in any individual queue, in the entire process. If something's been expedited and it hasn't been released for production, you can't add another. Fairly simple rule. Right? The other was nobody individually can decide that something is an expedited request or a silver bullet. It has to be agreed to by all of the voting members, VP of finance, sales, marketing, whatnot. So you had to convince your business owners, and you had to come with a business case that said, this was the reason it needed to be done. What it did is it took IT, it took the technical team out of the business of trying to decide winners and losers, and put that squarely in the business. It said, you decide what we do next. You, as a business, decide what the next most important thing is and then leave it to us to do the work. It actually created a pretty solid feedback me mechanism pretty quickly, that, and, and we found that very few items got expedited. Now, I know out in the Kanban community, there's a lot of discussion going on. Uh, seems to be a lot of discussion going on around class of service, uh, and this starts to look a little bit like class of service. This is where it began. But we, we did it in a very, very limited way, and we were always very nervous about it. The other thing we got rid of was due dates, right? which again is another class of service you see out in the Kanban community. Um, we can have some discussion, I think, at some point maybe afterwards about the, you know, the, the, the pluses and minuses, pros and cons of that kind of approach. I, I have some opinion about it, but um, I'll, 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 leave that for, I'll leave that for later. Um, so as I said, um, that particular mechanism got very rarely used, that silver bullet mechanism. Another interesting point that came up is really around service level agreements. What was our service level agreement? How did we report status? How did we report the, you know, how, 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 what was our agreement with the business? If they gave us something to work, how quickly would we get it done? Now we sweated over this quite a bit in the beginning. Uh, and established an SLA of 21 days. From the time it gets prioritized for work to the time it gets released, 21 days. Never made it once. 
Not once did we make a 21-day SLA. We eventually bumped it up to 28, but we had to start somewhere, right? We didn't have any data. We'd never collected any data. We had to put a stake in the ground, start somewhere. So we started with 21 days, bumped it up to 28, eventually settled on 31. What we found, though, was that our business didn't care. They didn't care that we weren't making the SLA because they could see where things were in the process. They could see where they were. We didn't, there was no surprises. It didn't get put into some black hole only to emerge three months later complete. They could track it at any point. And I think that kind of visibility, that kind of feedback mechanism is really what got us off the hook. Maybe, uh, maybe it was because the previous process has been so dysfunctional that uh, we'd managed to set the bar extremely low. So this, this is just some, this is some of the information, some of the stories, some of the, 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 the things that happened when we were creating this process, when we were working our way through this process. What's the point? Who cares, right? Ancient history happened 10 years ago. Why now? Why bother? It's important, I think, for a couple of reasons. And some of them are, are fairly trivial, almost petty. But some of them, I think, have a broader implication. So let's start with the petty ones first. I think, I think that the people who did the work should get credit for the work, right? Often history doesn't work that way. I'm not, I'm not so naive as to think that you know, it, it doesn't. The truth of the matter is it's easier to focus on an individual as being the father, the progenitor of Kanban, rather than think about all the aunts and uncles along the way, right? <clears throat> and so this is really just an attempt to, to kind of introduce some names to the record and, 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 and make folks aware of it. But also to make, I think, the point that we all have the opportunity at a very small, very fundamental, very daily level to participate in this kind of innovation and evolution of a process. We all bring value to the process. Great ideas can come from anywhere. I think it's also important because it illustrates the gulf that often occurs between theory and practice. All right? I'm a great fan of theory. I love theory. I really do but only in so far as it works in practice. The, the great American physicist, a guy named Richard Feynman, uh, he said that it doesn't matter how beautiful your theory is. It doesn't matter how smart you are. If it doesn't agree with experiment, it's wrong. And that's what we were doing, right? We were experimenting. And these theories that came in, do they work in, in practical fact? Well. Maybe there's some value there, but they require people actually fiddling at the edges to make it work, and that's what we did. Clearly, David Anderson brought the intellectual framework for Kanban into Corbis, and the theories as they apply to software engineering are, are, are really kind of compelling. But Kanban, as we know it in the industry today, wouldn't exist. Kanban workshops wouldn't be on the schedule at this conference. You wouldn't be sitting here listening to me rant if a group of people hadn't been specifically tasked with making that thing work in the real world. People like all of us in the room today. People who are smart, curious, driven to succeed. The solutions that we came up with worked for us at that time in that context. Now, I don't think anybody, any of us, were actually trying to create a development methodology. That's not what we were trying to do. We were just trying to make the system work so we wouldn't get sacked. With regard to the innovations that made our system work, that made Kanban sort of take off, nobody was guiding the team. Nobody was telling us which things to do, which processes to try, which innovations to try next. Everything we did, everything we did came from the team and was evaluated solely on the basis of whether it was effective or not. Now, anybody who tells you anything differently about the origin of Kanban is trying to sell you something. The larger reason I think it's important is because I believe as an industry, our focus is often in the wrong place. I think we tend to focus on learning prefabricated methodologies like Scrum and Kanban, understanding the ceremonies 
and artifacts that define those approaches and becoming as well practiced at them as we can. Learning the recipes as opposed to learning how to cook. We look outside our organizations and outside ourselves for consultants and coaches to come in and help us become better at these practices. Huge amounts of money are spent and made on certifications for various methodologies that uh, as a way of adding legitimacy to somebody's opinion of what we ought to or ought not to be doing, as, as though there's a growing sense of orthodoxy around what is agile and what is not. And what's the, <laughs> in the agile community, I mean, how many conversations have you been in or how many meetings have you been in where somebody has been, in a sense, set aside and told, oh, that's so waterfall. I mean, you don't believe me. How many people do you think would attend a, a, a Waterfall India con conference? Probably not a lot. But I think sometimes we use that word agile like a club. But it's my opinion that a scrum team or a Kanban team is of far less value to an organization than a team of agile thinkers, people who are grounded in and have a very deep understanding of the principles behind Agile, but are empowered to question everything, to experiment, to fail, to learn, and to move on. And when I say question everything, I mean question everything. Why do we reduce the work, or why do we limit the work in progress if we have dedicated resources? Do we need to do that? Maybe, maybe not. If we're working in an MVP model, if we're working toward a, a minimally viable product, do we really need to do sprints? Maybe, maybe not. Are we getting the kind of value out of our stand-up that we really think we are? These are important questions to ask at the grassroots level, to be empowered and empower our teams to ask those questions, to try something new, micro, micro improvements on a daily basis. So this is a bit of confession time here, and I, you know, may get, I may get beaten up in the lobby over this. But I'm not a fan of Scrum. Not a big Scrum fan. But obviously I have a soft spot in my heart for Kanban, right? And I've used it to great effect at a number of organizations now. As much as I love it, it will not last forever. Neither will Scrum. Ten years ago, the industry looked very different than it does today. Ten years on, it's going to look very different than it does now. It's evolution, and it's relentless. As great as an idea may be, it won't be the theorists that demonstrate its value. It's going to be up to the men and women in the trenches every day, people like all y'all in the room, to prove the value and demonstrate those val that, the value of that theory, to make that theory or those ideas work in the real world. And that requires an agile mind. So that's the end of my rant. Um, I, I'm, I'm sure we've got some time. So if you have questions that specifically you want to dig into or challenge, questions you have around what went down and why it matters or uh, uh, where we think the 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 evolution of the process is going. I'd love to hear it. The team size? Yeah. Uh, so this was a sustainment, it, it's the interesting thing. So this was our sustainment engineering effort. And we had said that as an organization, we'll dedicate 10% of our team, 10% of our team's overall capacity to sustainment, to support and sustainment. So there was no dedicated team. It was a pooled, it was sort of a pooled resource. And, and the way it worked is that we established WIP limits based on 10% capacity. If we had 30 developers, we had three, you know, we had a WIP limit of three, for example. So there was no dedicated team. The way it worked is that when an item came in and we, it got assigned to a specific developer because they had specific domain knowledge, they would pick that item up, work it, move it on, and then go back to their project work. It was a little disruptive, right? It would disrupt the projects. 
There was a little bit of inefficiency, but that was the overall design. So there really was no team size per se. Now subsequently, we've used it in, um, in project teams of varying sizes, from very small, just a couple of, just a couple of folks, up to uh, projects that had 25 developers, but we started to use, we started to modify the process a little bit and get into something that was maybe a little bit more lean and not so much Kanban. I don't know, does that answer your question? Yes. For us, it was, it was all part of this process of putting prioritization onto the business, of creating a mechanism where they were responsible, right? There were rules of engagement, but they were responsible for telling us what the next most important thing was. They knew that, they had, that we had five slots open in our engineering ready queue, and if there were three slots open that particular day, that they could prioritize three things. They had to argue among themselves as to what came next. When we said you get one silver bullet, we got everybody to buy in, and the business self-policed. We didn't really actually have to say that anymore. Right? You had a VP over here in sales saying, we've really got to get this done, and the VP of finance saying, I don't see the business value. I don't see the ROI. Show me the ROI, and I'll believe you. Right? They became self-policing. It took some time and it took some evolution. But by putting the focus over on them and the, the business side, it got us off the hook. I don't know, maybe, it, maybe you've got other kinds of challenges. This is, I mean, this actually gets to the, the point, uh, you know, one of the points that maybe I didn't beat over the head enough, that this is a process that worked for us and this is what we came up with in that time at that place. Your results may vary, actual mileage may vary, right? That, that I think it's difficult and probably the wrong way to go about it to say, give me a boxed, contained methodology that I can just adapt wholesale without, doing, with, without thinking it you know, from, from the ground up, some more grassroots. What works specifically in your organization? What does your culture support? Process and culture being very, very intimately connected. I could no more come to India and say, you know how you guys can fix your traffic problems? Do it like we do in the United States, right? That's not going to work, right? It's a different culture. It's a different way of thinking. <laughs> well, there you go. See, there you go. I'm sorry, you had a question. I'd like to think that all my success comes from my charm. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> uh, I, you know, I, that's an interesting question. Who knows? I mean, it's, it's a difficult thing to kind of prize apart. Again, again it goes back to this, this Tolstoy, uh, Tolstoy idea that all happy families are the same, all unhappy families are unhappy in their own specific way, right? There's so many factors that can go wrong that you, uh, it's, hard to, it's hard to know. You know. It's all part and parcel of the same thing. The queuing theory is interesting in that it works outside of prioritization. Um, when I first started doing, uh, when I was first introduced to these, these ideas, these concepts, uh, I, uh, I went home, I was trying to explain them to my wife. And you know, she was busy, didn't have time, wasn't understanding it, didn't really care to understand, whatever. I don't know, she's actually sitting over there so she can correct me if I'm wrong. But I said, okay, hey look, here's what I'll do. In order to sort of model this and explain it, we'll, we'll do the laundry using Kanban, right? No prioritization, right? But we'll do the laundry doing Kanban. She, she, you know, she's scratching her head going, I don't, I don't get it. So, no, no, okay, here's, here's how it'll work. Don't take stuff out of the dryer until you're ready to fold it and put it away. Now that creates capacity in the dryer. You can take stuff out of the washer and put it in the dryer and then you can, you know, She's, you know, so I did that. I did that for a couple of weeks, right? I, I, I ran it that way, doing the laundry. There's me doing the laundry, you know, and see, see, there's the theory. And then after a couple of weeks, I went to her and I said, look, my love, I'm, I'm very sorry. I know I've been kind of crazy about this, but I'm just interested in these ideas and, you know, I'm kind of excited about them. And she said, sorry, you're doing the laundry. <laughs> 
Um, so I think that the, the, the queuing theory works without the, the prioritization, right? How you feed information into the front end is, is a separate sort of consideration. You can even do class of service kinds of considerations up front as long as it doesn't affect that queuing mechanism. Yeah, David, le David left in uh, January 2008. Um, uh, it continued uh, through 2008, and then I left at the th end of 2008. Uh, it, it, it continued as, you know, we had sort of institutionalized it at that point, and it was, again, because it came from a kind of grassroots thing, it wasn't a difficult thing to maintain. That was the culture. That was how we did it. The mechanisms were in place. It continued to work very effectively. Uh, where it got off the rails is when we tried to apply it to projects without modifying it somewhat. And I think people like Dan Vacanti have done some work subsequently and others to actually apply it to more of a project-based thing. Now, after I left, after some other uh, folks left, we got a new CIO. They don't use it anymore. They're actually, uh, Corbis has gone back to a kind of waterfall model. So a sad ending, sorry. <laughs> Uh, th that's an interesting question, I guess. We, des we designed the process specifically around sustainment and maintenance in a pooled environment. So being able to apply those to projects uh, and do it effectively, I think, has, 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 has been big. I think one of the biggest contributions, frankly, and biggest improvements is some real codification of the analytics around flow and predictability. There's been some great work done, I think, in, in demonstrating how you can get to a greater and more predictable system through better flow and better throughput. So I think that's, that's been some great work. Yes? Oh, that's an interesting question. Um, I can only speculate about how Kanban as an idea came from, from Japanese manufacturing into the, into the US market. It's maybe a coincidence, and this is maybe kind of odd, but I'll bring it up, that uh, David uh, you know, was very fascinated with Japanese culture and very exposed to that, um, and, and included in his theories other kinds of um, uh, ideas that came out of Japanese manufacturing, you know, uh, the elimination of waste and that sort of thing that came out of lean and the Toyota, the Toyota manufacturing. Um, what's your second question, though? I mean, the, the de this, take the DevOps question separately, but what was your... You know, it's interesting because uh, Dominica de Grandis, who was on the team originally, has actually been doing a great deal of work around the application of Kanban to DevOps. Um, I don't, it's not, it's not an area that I've really dived into, but I don't see that anything that's inherently contradictory. Again, it's a, it's a flexible, mo it's flexible enough as a, as a model that I think you can apply it in a variety of contexts, whether that's software development or laundry or or you know DevOps or or whatever, um, and I, I think it brings me. Let me while I'm thinking about it to a point where people will say, "Oh well, it's very loose. Like Kanban's very loose, and Scrum is very structured." I don't see it that way at all. I think Kanban is a very highly structured way of working. It just happens to be very flexible and adaptable. You can use it in different ways, but the rules tend to be the same, and the theory behind the rules don't change. Right? Limit, uh, limit the work in progress. Focus on quality. Focus on flow and throughput, you know, those, those kinds of things. How DevOps affects that, I don't, 
I, I don't know that, I don't see that I, I see a contradiction or a risk there, but I think the market or the, the industry, the, the community of, of DevOps is gonna have to, to prove that out. I don't know, that sounds like a dodge, doesn't it? It sounds like I'm ducking the question. <laughs> yes? I think that I, I think that what a first attracted it, us to it was that that theory, right? With the, the theory that you can get to a probabilistic means of determining when software is likely to be done, rather than a predictive measure, rather than sit here and say we think it will take us three months, say switching that around and being able to say based on the data, based on data we've collected, we have a 95% likelihood of delivering anything you give us within a you know, certain size within three weeks, right? That's our, that's our, and then you know, one standard deviation out or two standard deviations out, here's what it looks like. I think that's what attracted, it, attracted us, right? And what drove us was really, I think, a belief in, that, in those ideas and a desire to make it work. But then, as it was originally presented to us, it, it, it's not as though the theory was incomplete, but the practice that supported the theory hadn't been fleshed out yet, and that's where we were able to contribute. That's where we were able to engage. And once you start to see things actually work, there's something very, very exciting about being part of something that you create, right? As a process, you create, and it was very much a grassroots effort, very much us on the ground participating in doing this thing and, and seeing a difference. Does that answer your question? And, of course, the fear of getting sacked. <laughs> yes? So I've heard the story of Robert from David uh, Baker. Huh? I mean, that's, that's, that's it. I th everybody seems to want to know what's the future. I, I, I don't know. I think uh, it's not so much that Kanban or Scrum are going to fade into non-use. I think it's that increasingly we're going to get away from these macro processes that everybody adopts and get into more dialects, more flavors of things that are much more local and much more um, idiosyncratic, things that address our particular culture, right? I think. My experience has been that you cannot come in and lay on top of an organization a process which the culture doesn't support. It just doesn't work. It won't take root. It won't be effective. It just it creates a great deal of frustration. And I think ultimately what, what we need is more sort of framework around which to, to, to engage, like a Kanban or a Lean or a, you know, whether it's Scrum or whatever, and then allow teams to find local solutions within that that fit their culture. Again, that sounds like a dodge to the question, but none of us can predict, can pre predict the future. And I haven't actually participated uh, to a great extent in the Kanban community, mostly because I just went out and got a job and have been doing it you know, in my own. You know, I've had conversations with guys like Dan Vacanti. And the last time I saw David Anderson actually was uh, um, in a restaurant in West Seattle in Washington. That was a while ago. Any other questions? Yes. That Kanban is useful for only certain things. Mm. Or in other words, where you can't use Scrum, then go for Kanban really without even understanding. Just have a board and you don't have the time boxing, so it's Kanban. So what are the different ways in which Kanban can be used along with Scrum, maybe even within a sprint we are experimenting with some of our projects, that can we increase the effectiveness of sprint execution? Can we have, say, Scrum at the product level and uh, 
Kanban for the teams. So uh, you must be having experiences with these kind of possibilities. So I thought I'll ask you. Uh, I, I mean, my opinion is my yes. My considered opinion is that you you don't. It's not a binary world. You know, you don't have to do Scrum or Kanban. Right? It's it's just not that way. That um, these are these are ideas, frameworks, tools, things that you can apply. And you shouldn't be afraid uh, to experiment, to figure out what does work, to say and do it in a hypothesis-driven way. Here's my hypothesis. I believe that we can manage our product in a Scrum-like way. But within that, I want to track the work within sprints using Kanban, and here's how we're going to do it. And experiment, see how it works, see what you, you know, it, does it need tweaking in order to actually uh, be more effective? And what does the team think? How does the team engage and get ideas from the team? Um, again, to, to my mind, the whole lesson here is that we shouldn't be constrained to think about these things in a particular way. And for me, Kanban kind of helped get me out of that. But I don't also want to then turn around and say, well, Kanban has to be done in a particular way. Right? It just, it, that feels wrong to me. So again, to me, it goes back to experimentation. It goes back to question everything. Do you need to do sprints, right? I, maybe you do, maybe you don't. Uh, so, I don't know, does that, does that answer your question? Oh, good, yes, I'm glad I could help. <laughs> yes? Uh-huh. Yeah, I, I, I somehow suspected that this question would come up when I said I didn't like Scrum. Um, I, you know, I think it would be, it would be interesting maybe uh, next year to have a, uh, you know, a uh, uh, panel discussion sponsored by Absolute Vodka, you know, and talk about the, uh, the pros and cons. Um, I, I just, I feel it's less about Scrum as a methodology and more a kind of religious adherence to Scrum. Uh, that, that, I, that I find most troubling. You know, the unwillingness to say that doesn't work or it doesn't work within our organization. I think a lot of times what happens is that organizations feel that if they can't apply Scrum by the book, it's their fault and not the problem of the, the, the or the, you know, the inappropriateness of the, the methodology. I don't know, I wouldn't really label it as being Kanban is better than Scrum. I would say that for some organizations, it works better in some situations than Scrum. Uh, but that doesn't mean that organizations can't also be very, very successful with Scrum. I just, I, I happen to find it, it just, it, it, it's too constraining for me. I want to do things differently. Also, I hate the style of stand-up. I got to confess, I hate the style of stand-up. I prefer a stand-up that focuses on the work and not on individuals, right? Focus on the baton, not the runner. And I think a lot of times we focus on what you did yesterday, what you're going to do today. As an experiment, you want to try an experiment, go back, <clears throat> run your scrum style stand up. What did you do yesterday? What did you do today? What did you do that around the team? And then pick somebody at random and ask them what the third person did yesterday and see if they can remember. And then decide whether or not that information, that time spent getting that information was well used. But that's a little provocative, isn't it? Any other questions? Again, I really appreciate you coming out. I know that uh, you know even now India and Australia are doing battle. Do we have an update on the match? Does anybody? Would, I'm sorry. I have no idea what that means because I'm from America. But is that is that good or? <laughs> okay. All right. <laughs> All right. Again, thank you everybody. Thank you for your time. Have a good day.